I'm just going to read a couple verses at the, in the middle of chapter 1, and then we'll continue where we left off last week. I heard several people through the week and then even today talk about their homework. Uh, I'll just ask the positive. How many people did their homework this week? All right, three of us did our homework. <laughs> well, that's going to make it tough when I start making comments about uh, <laughs> what it takes to be a spiritual Christian. <laughs> the, the homework was to read 1 Corinthians because there is a problem at Corinth about them being carnal, and we'll, we'll talk about that. In fact, I'll just ask your questions about that to see if you remember, because that's an important part of, of what the book is. Uh, we did say, uh, just in a way of introduction, we're, we're not, there's a lot of detail, and a lot, you know, when I'm, even when I'm re-looking and trying to look at blocks <laughs> of information to take you through the book, uh, that I have questions about things, and I look in, and, and every, time, every time I've ever read the Bible, I've seen things that I never saw before. And even in the first four chapters, I, I've learned some things that I thought, well, I can't even teach that because now I'm getting so deep into something that we we're trying to do overview. Um, but anyhow, the, in order to do an overview, we're, we're trying to look at sections, and uh, I forget where I was going with that. Um, but uh, the problem with the Corinthians is they're car carnal. And what we did as a, kind of an introduction to the overview last week is I went through, I didn't even number them here, but I got oh, at least uh, 15 things that we looked at uh, where there was a problem at Corinth. And there's certainly that the Apostle Paul writes the book of 1 Corinthians as a book of reproof because of the Corinthians weren't living Christian lives. They weren't living spiritual lives. They were living carnal lives, and, and, and the problem that they have with carnality is they didn't know God's word, and as a result of that, uh, Paul writes 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians is a remedy for carnality, and so that's why we were saying that if that's a fact, then, then we've got to at least read 1 Corinthians, uh, and that's not just 1 Corinthians. All of Paul's epistles give us the mind of Christ. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, it says, uh, verse 6, it says, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The idea there is that, uh, that they're saved, and they don't lack anything they need to become spiritual, all the way into the coming of Christ. And then it says in verse 8, Who shall confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful, by whom ye, ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, that, ye, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the, in, in the same judgment. Now that verse 10 there is a key to everything in, in the book of Corinthians, it, but, but when I say a key to everything in the book of Corinthians, it's a key to uh, the, the contention that he's going to talk about in verse 11, and then as he goes on to call it in chapter 3, divisions among them. It's, it's the remedy for all the conflict that, that, that we listed out last week in looking at 1 Corinthians. It's the remedy for carnality, and that's what he la labels them carnal. It, it's, the, it's the answer to all the questions and problems that the Corinthians faced and that we'll ever face. Is, is all of us having what it says at verse uh, 10 there, that we may all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We, we need to have the same mindset, and when you say judgment there, you're not talking about judgment in the sense of judging each other. You're talking about situations that you face, the discernment on how to deal with the situation, what is the right way to deal with the situation, that you might have the mind of Christ in all those situations. And so verse 10, that's really the goal of this book. And, and to give them that mind of Christ, look at chapter 2 and verse 16. It says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And, and, and that's the Apostle Paul particularly saying that the things that he's revealing in the book of 1 Corinthians, he has the mind of Christ. And if we're all to mind the same thing, what are we to mind? 
what Christ minds. <laughs> we need to think the way Christ thinks about all the situations and when we have to make judgment, discernments about matters, that they're the judgment and discernment that we would get from the scriptures. And, and so that's the goal in, verse, in chapter 1 and verse 10 for the Corinthians and the remedy for, for all the things that are, all the problems, all the questions, all the carnality, all the conflict, all the contention, all the divisions. Uh, and, and that's not just for the Corinthians. <laughs> that would be for all of us as well. And so this book is to give us the mind of Christ concerning those things, and, and to Paul was given that mind of Christ. Now, before we continue a little bit in chapter 1, look over back to chapter 3, because we named all the kinds of problems that they're having, and they all stem from what Paul, calls, what, sa what Paul says here in the first part of chapter 3. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are, uh, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men. Now, just so we all have the same mindset before we can study more in Corinthians, there is three types of Christians, believers, that are talked about actually all in verse 1. So let me ask you first, in this order, what is a spiritual believer? What would be a definition of a spiritual believer? He says, and I, brethren, could not write unto you as unto spiritual. A mature Christian. Okay. okay. But that's kind of vague, what maturity is. But certainly, a spiritual Christian is a mature Christian. But what is that then? Okay, walk after the Spirit, but there's a whole bunch of people that do all kinds of crazy things saying they're walking after the Spirit. So that needs a little bit to find. What's that, Lou? He walks in the Word. Right. To be spiritually minded is to know, you know, when it said there in verse 16, uh, like, like verse 15 of chapter 2, it says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So a man who's spiritual, he can have proper judgment. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath instructed him? But we have the mind of Christ. Someone who takes the mind of Christ and puts it inside them, and then you, it's not only to have the, the understanding of God's word and God's will, but then to yield to it. To be spiritual is to know God's word and God's will in a situation and yield yourself to that rather than your own opinion. So that's what someone who's spiritual is. Now, Paul writes in chapter 3 and verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. What's a babe in Christ? A young one. Okay, a young one. So explain what a young one is. What's that? Not well versed in the scripture. Okay, you took the second step. If you take the very just na nature of the word itself, the person just got saved. He's a babe. But then... If he's just a babe, then he doesn't know anything about the Bible. He just got saved. So all he knows is how he was brought up, how mom and dad taught him to live, and sometimes how he, his, his environment taught him to live, or, or the, the social pressures taught him to live. Uh, the, all he has is worldly ways that he was raised, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but that's all he knows. He doesn't know how to live for the Lord. He doesn't know what the Lord would have him to do, and, and, uh, and so he can't make those decisions. He might have the desire to yield to it, but then he's got to learn what it is. So he's a babe, and because he's a babe, he hasn't taken in much of God's word, so he's a babe. Now, that's, I say, I started out with spiritual and went to babe, because what is a carnal Christian? The Corinthians were carnal. That's what Paul says they were. So what is that? Right. If, if again, look at verse 3. For, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying strife and divisions. Now that's, envy, strife, and division makes it obvious that the people he's dealing with are carnal. Because they're not making proper spiritual decisions. If they did, they wouldn't be envying and, uh, and have strife and divisions. Those things happen as a result of carnality. He says, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And when he says walk as men, you walk as lost people. Walk like an unsaved person walks. Live like an unsaved person lives. Now, 
Why do they live that way? Well, you say they're carnal. What does it mean to be carnal? Well, verse 1 tells you, doesn't it? When it says, even as babes, are the Corinthians babes in Christ? No, they're not. They, Paul led them to the Lord, spent a year and a half at Corinth in Acts chapter 18. These people aren't babies at all. They've had God's word. They've had the Apostle Paul himself teaching them. So they're not babes. But if they didn't learn God's word, take it in so that they have the mind of Christ and then yield to the things that God said, they actually are, rather than learning God's word and living according to God's word, they're living like lost people. They're, they're, going, they're reverting back to how they think about things and making their own personal decisions as, as from the flesh. And that's why Paul's going to condemn the flesh all the way through, especially the first four chapters here. So a carnal person is a person who's been saved a long time, but has not read the first book of 1 Corinthians, and therefore doesn't know how to make judgments concerning all kinds of things, all kind, every problem that's in Corinth. If someone hadn't read the book of Corinthians, all they can do is react from their own thinking, like men, rather than the mind of Christ. And in order not to be carnal, you have to take in the mind of Christ, which is God's word to us. And, uh, and so that's why we're saying how important it is to read 1 Corinthians. Now that's just 1 Corinthians. Of course, all of Paul's epistles tells you that it's important to, to, to read all of Paul's epistles so that you're not that way. And you're able to have the mind of Christ and, and to speak the same thing as it says in verse chapter 1, verse 10, and, and that you might be perfectly joined together, even as an assembly with the same mind and having the same judgment, discernment about things that have to be, choices that have to be made. Um, so obviously, as, as we just said, carnality, the sign of that is envy, strife, and division. Look at chapter 1, verse 11. It says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Clo, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, and he's going to deal with the contentions, and we'll talk about that as we move on. But, but again, there's uh, contentions among them, and that's a sign that there's carnality among them. And, and so there's carnal, carnality, and as a result of that, they've got all these this problems going on. And other than, than, uh, than, than, than having the mind of Christ about some things, they're, they're, these people were following, as you're going to see there in verse 12, their problem was is that they were following and glorying in men rather than knowing and following God's appointed apostle. Now, the, when you say walk as men, certainly look at verse 12. It says, Now I say that every one of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. So you get the idea from that verse is that they got their eyes fixed on men. And some, we'll deal with that verse a little bit closer because, you know, we could even be accused by others of, of practicing the first part of that. But what I want you to see is that in their carnality, they're following, and not just following, they're glor glorying in man. Rather than in, if spirituality is in what Christ said, what God said to us, and then allowing that to dictate our life, if they're glorying in men, that, then certainly there's going to have the divisions and contentions among them. And so that's what they're doing. They're following and they're glorying in men rather than knowing and following God's word to us, which came through the Apostle Paul. But, so you got verse 12 there. Let me just show you several verses that keep reminding you of that in case you lose sight of that through the first four chapters. Look at chapter 1, verse 26. It says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. So he, he's pointing out, you, you guys are following men, but, but look, at, look at the believers as compared to the world. And they're not, they're not the noble ones, and they're not the, uh, uh, what's the list say, the, the wise of this world. And uh, it's not the mighty of this world, the powerful of the world. Verse 31 of chapter 1. It says that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Well, the reason Paul gets to that point is they're not glorying in the Lord. They immediately start latching on to men, and it's the wisdom of this world, it's men of this world, and they're not glorying in the Lord like they ought to. Chapter uh, 2, well, there's a whole bunch of things to say about chapter 2, but we'll deal that when we look at this, this section again. Go, go to chapter 3 and look at verse 4. It says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? 
but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Now you see that they're, they're not really considering what the Lord said about something. What they're considering about is Paul and Apollos. And, and, and so you see how they're glorying in men, even from those verses. Uh, verse 21, it says, Therefore let no man glory in man, men, for all things are yours. And it explains that further, but when he says, therefore, let no man glory in men, that's what the Corinthians were doing. They're certainly glorying in men rather than learning the truth of God's word. Chapter 4, verse 1, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, you, you think about the reckoning of, okay, you're talking about Paul. Some people are saying, well, Paul, if you're going to think about Paul, how should you think about Paul? Well, Paul tells you, here's how you ought to think about us. Chapter well, 4 and verse 6. These things, brethren, have I in a figure transferred to myself and, and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no man of you be puffed up for one against another. See the envying strife, divisions, men puffed up, because they haven't learned to think about men above, or they're... They're not to think about men above that which is written. Well, we just talked about verse, chapter 4, verse 1. What's written of Paul? How you ought to think about him. And, and, and the, I mean, not only the fact that the Bible says all men are sinners, but if you're going to think about men, think about what the Bible says about the men. Don't just think about the man himself. And that's what they're doing. They're glorying in the man rather than what the Bible says about men or any particular man, even particularly the Apostle Paul. So when you get over to verse 16 of chapter 4, it says, Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. Now, you realize chapters 1 through 4 is one section of this book. And it's quite interesting because you start out in chapter 1 in verse 11 and 12 that there's contentions. And the first thing he says, some people are saying, I am of Paul. Then you go through four chapters, and you come over to chapter 4 and verse 16, and he says, Wherefore, here's the conclusion, be, follower, be ye followers of me. <laughs> now, you couldn't jump from chapter 1 to chapter 4 without be just looking at man and following a man. That you needed to look at the arguments that are between chapters 1 and 4 so that you'll come to a conclusion based on God's word about following Paul. And uh, so I always found that interesting, how that you start out with a problem and he gets all the way to the point where he can actually just come out and say it, follow me. And, uh, and so we'll look at those arguments in just a minute. But before I go any further into chapter 4, because we want to look at that close, maybe a little closer than, than we'll look at some other sections, uh, unless some of those other sections you want to look more into because there's a lot of questions. The world, we said last week, the church at large is, is the Corinthian church today. You, those so-called, and sometimes we don't even know if they're believers or not, what goes around in Christian dumb, almost everything can be solved with a proper understanding of 1 Corinthians. And so we might need to take more time in areas that I wasn't planning to take the time in uh, for your sake, but we can do that for your sake. Anyhow, what I want to do here is let's, I gave you an overview of all the problems at Corinth. Let me give you an overview of the outline of the book of Corinthians. If you go, look again to chapter 1 in verse 9, After Paul does this introduction to the book of 1 Corinthians, he says in verse 9, he said, God is faithful by whom ye are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the greatest things that I think about 1 Corinthians, and I said it last week, so I'm just repeating myself here, and that is that you could list all the problems, all the things that the Corinthians were doing, all that they were getting wrong, all the uh, divisions and, 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 and contentions there were among them, and, and if you look at their life and even some of the things they were involved in, you wouldn't necessarily call them believers or as we would call them Christians uh, because of the way they lived. And yet Paul, the, the way the book of Corinthians starts, the first ten verses of 1 Corinthians is confirming God's faithfulness. That these people are saved and secure in Christ. As verse, there, there, verse uh, 7 there, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're... They're saved and secure, waiting for the day of redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you unto the end, 
So the, 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 not no confirmation on their part, but he's going to confirm them unto the end. They belong to him. That ye may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they get raptured out. They're going to be blameless there. And why is that all going to happen? Because God, well, it says God is faithful, by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And they're in fellowship with God in Christ. And, and so they're confirmed unto the end. So the whole point of this is that, that chapter, uh, chapter 1 it, it starts out with just confirming God's faithfulness, securing the fact that these people are saved. And the reason I said that I think that's the, so remarkable is that people always want to judge whether a person's saved or not by the way they live. And you learn in Corinthians, you don't judge someone whether they're saved or not by the way they live. You judge on what they believe. And, and Paul has no problem except when you come to 15 and, and some are starting to deny the resurrection, then he says, then your faith could be vain. But as far as the Corinthians and the fact that they were believers when he was there, the ones that, that the ones he's writing to and the ones he knows, that, uh, that they're confirmed unto the end because God is faithful. So that, that's the introduction, that's the first part. Now the second part of the book is the major part. It's going to take you from chapter 1, verse 11, all the way to chapter 15, verse 58. And, and, and we can just actually label it the conflict of carnality at Corinth. Pretty <laughs> nice bunch of C's there. And, and, and really that's the basics of the book and, and it's really broken down into three parts. For instance, in chapter 1 verse 11, you can see that there's these reported problems. Apparently when you read 1 Corinthians, it's not long that you realize that Paul had been to Corinth, and we could talk about that, I'm, I'm going to try not to go back to Acts 18 because we've already studied the book of Acts and hopefully you got some understanding of that and if you don't, when you're at home, do your homework, read Acts chapter 18 when Paul first went there and when the, the Corinthian church was first established. But um, that Paul had eventually left there and then the Corinthians sent a letter to Paul, like for instance in verse chapter 1 verse 11, it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Clo. So there's some contact where Paul had with the house of Clo that there's a problem at Corinth. Later on you'll see that there's some like letters that were written, so whether it was a personal contact by the house of Clo or a letter that came from the house of Clo, but Paul said he knows some things that are going on at Corinth, and he doesn't say, someone told me. He actually throws the person's name out to verify this is a real problem. You got a person there, and here's the person who reported it. If he's lying, let me know. But the problem is he's not lying. <laughs> he could act, so, you know, it, when you when whenever something is, someone told me something, all that's hearsay and can't be substantiated, Paul doesn't hold back. He said it's reported in the house of Clo that there are contentions among you. And then he explains why he believes it, <laughs> because of the things that they're debating over, fighting over. So anyhow, the first part, when you get through chapter, chapter 1 through chapter 4, these are reported problems, and the first reported problem is the contentions and divisions among them. Come over to chapter 5, verse 1. It is recorded, it, it is recorded commonly, reported, <laughs> not recorded, reported. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now it's the first part of that verse. Someone reported about contentions and divisions, and Paul deals with contention and divisions based on that report. Now he's going to deal with fornication among them and their attitude toward that fornication because it's been reported to him, it's, common, it's reported commonly that there's fornication. So he's dealing with reported problems. When you go over to chapter 6 and verse 1, he doesn't say it's reported. He just goes right from chapter 5 into the things that he's going to bring up in chapter 6 where he just simply says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And he starts dealing with him. But when he starts there, Dare any of you to go to, uh, to having a matter against another go to law? Apparently it's been reported to Paul like, you know, we're, we have this assembly. We call ourselves the body of Christ, but we're going to court and suing each other before un unsaved judges to solve matters of conflict between each other. And, and that's going on, and Paul, he just simply says, dare any of you? And the reason he's saying that is apparently he's got a report that they're doing this. Uh, and so he's dealing with that problem in chapter 6. So he's dealing with reported problems. Then when you get, come to chapter 7, it's, it changes a little bit. 
it says in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now concerning things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And so now when you begin in chapter 7 all the way through chapter 11, Paul's going to deal with some things, what I call Q&A, question and answers. But they're requested answers. They requested Paul to, to tell them about some things. And you can see that they don't have the discernment. The first thing he's going to deal with in, in, in this chapter 7 is the problem of marriage, the problem of divorce, the problem of remarriage. And, and he's going to deal with that quite thoroughly through chapter 7. They didn't have the mind of Christ. And, and so they, they needed some answers, and Paul writes to them about, uh, about the things that they were questioning on, on those matters. Chapter 8, verse 1. I always like the word now. Do you see how it starts different chapters? First, chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Now touching things whereof, uh, at, now as, as touching things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. <laughs> Don't you hate that when someone says that? We all know this. And that's almost like a mockery on Paul's part because he's going to go on and talk about, no, we don't all have knowledge. <laughs> and that's why you've got to watch out for the weaker brother. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. And, and so you see what he's going to start dealing with in chapter 8 here is uh, apparently they wrote to him and asked him some things about, uh, what about meats that have been offered to an idol? Is it okay to eat it? Uh, and, and so he had got to deal with the problem of the meats, the problem with association with idolatry, uh, the problem of the, of the proper use of Christian liberty. And, and he's going to deal with that in chapter 8 and all the way through chapter 9. And then watch chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and, and what Paul does in chapter, if you watch chapter 10, and then when you get over, oh, um, I just pick out a verse. Look at uh, verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the tables of devils. My point to you is chapter 10 is still dealing with the problem back there in chapter 8 and 9. But when it starts in chapter 10 with the word moreover, it's like Paul answers their question about meats, about idolatry, uh, uh, about Christian liberty, and then he says there's more to say about this. So moreover, there's more to learn on this subject, and that's what chapter 10 takes them even to a higher degree of understanding about their Christian liberty and fleeing idolatry and so forth, and that's what chapter 10 is about. So he deal, dealt with in, in chapter 7 through 11 of requested answers where they, re, they had questions that he answered for them. So then you come to chapter uh, 11 in verse 2. 11 verse 2 says, and there's that word now, it says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And when he talks about ordinances here, he's not talking about the ordinances of Israel under the law. He's talking about things of order, proper order. The first thing that he deals with here, and, and, the, and the point is, is he's actually going to reprove them. These are reproved declarations. Paul's going to declare some things to them in a, in a way of reproof, the first thing he has to deal with is a problem uh, within marriage of, uh, of uh, the ordinance of marriage or actually the right place of a woman and a man as certainly when you read the, the, from chapter 2 uh, of verse 11 down to verse 16 there, that women began to rebel against their place in the home and, and under the man and Paul deals with that. I would just call it woman's lib back in Bible days. Then you get to... Uh, um, in the same chapter, verse 17, it says, Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. And if you're familiar with this passage, this is now he's going to go into how they're conducting themselves at a time that they're actually celebrating the Lord's Supper. And, and they're, he, he says, I'm not going to praise you in this. <laughs> he says, it's amazing what he says. He says, uh, uh, Oh, where does it say that? Oh, verse 17. I just read it and didn't realize I said it. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. What? <laughs> Boy, you talk about a rebuke. <laughs> You're coming together, and it's not for the better. It's, it'd been better if you didn't come together because of the, what's, what's being done when you're together. But I say all this. Remember, all that started out with, you remember the ordinances that I delivered them unto you? Look at verse 34 of chapter 11. 
If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. So when he's talking about ordinances here, he's not talking about legal ordinances, he's talking about order, things that are done right and orderly. And so he's, he's reproving things that are out of order and putting them in order. Now, another part of that reproved declaration, chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, now concerning spiritual gifts, you see all the word nows? You, can, you realize you finish one thing, now the next thing. And so this book is really kind of easy to outline. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would, have you, I would not have you ignorant. And then he starts dealing with the spiritual gifts. And the problem with spiritual gifts, it's going to go chapter 12, 13, and 14. Look at chapter 14 and verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. <laughs> you see, see how everything is setting things in order? And he's rebuking them because they didn't have order to any of this. It was all done out of order, and he's setting the proper order. He's rebuking them and, uh, and setting the proper order in, in that area of concerning spiritual gifts. Then you get to that chapter 15, and look at verse 1, just like chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. And, and so on top of everything that he said in order, above it all, something that's maybe more significant, more concerning to him, and that is going to be the problem of resurrection. He says, uh, 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 Moreover, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. And the vain, the vanity is that some, well, chapter, look over chapter 15 and verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? <laughs> so, this is a major problem. So, he's reproving them on, their, on, on some of the things that they're uh, doubting or deciding not to believe in or questioning concerning the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ or the resurrection uh, of, of themselves. The, what we, it's gonna, for us, it will take place at the rapture. So, he deals with them. Now, that takes you all the way to chapter 16. Now, see, the body... Of the, of the book of Corinthians is conflict of, car, carnal, of carnality at Corinth, reported problems, requested answers, reproved declarations. Then you come to chapter 16, and then he says, Now, concerning the collection of, for, uh, for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. And so now he's going to deal not so much with a problem that they have, but concerning the fact that he's taking up a collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem, which is what Acts chapter 19 and, and 20 is about, and, uh, and, and how Paul's going to carry that to, to Jerusalem. So he gives some information about that collection in verses 1 through 9. And then he greets people from the churches, sends greetings from the different churches in verses 10 through uh, 20. Look at verse 19. It says, the churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla salute you in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So there's like greetings going back and forth between the churches. And then there's this mighty conclusion to the book of Corinthians, which is worth reading. Verse 21, the salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. And those last verses are the conclusion of the book. So the last chapter is the collection and conclusion uh, of the book of Corinthians. So we just did an overview of 1 Corinthians. <laughs> now let's go back to chapter 1 because there's really some real important things here. Now what we've already pointed out is that carnality is following and glorying in man rather than knowing and following God's appointed apostle. I've said that before. Add one more thought to that. It's really not, a, really, it's not an additional information. It's just a kind of a repetitive way of saying something. Is that carnality is following and glorying in men rather than knowing and following God's appointed apostle and revelation. <coughs> When I said it's kind of repetitive, what does it mean to follow God's appointed apostle? Just wherever he walks, you just walk behind him? <laughs> no, apostle is one sent forth with a message. That's the very definition of an apostle. So it's not when you follow an apostle, you're not just following in his footsteps in the sense of wherever he walked, you're going to walk. It's, it's follow the revelation that was given. That's, that's, what, that's what you're to follow. 
And, and so that's what the, the solution to carnality is. Um, and and uh, back in ch chapter 1, verse 12, now, it's, there's contentions among them. Paul says in verse, chapter 1, verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Now, certainly because we understand the dispensation of grace and understand why in chapter 4, verse 16, where Paul says, Be followers of me, we say we follow Paul. When we say we follow Paul, we're not Corinthians who are glorying in men. Oh, Paul's so wonderful. He's the greatest apostle that ever... He's the greatest evangelist. Most people, when they talk about Paul, that's what they say about him. They're glorying in the man and maybe his achievements. If you're spiritual, you're going to believe what the Bible says about the man. And what did Paul say in chapter 4 and verse 1? Now let every man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Paul's nothing. He even said, we'll see the verse again, we already read it once, where I'm, a, I'm nothing, Apollos is nothing. See, we don't glory in Paul because we just pick him out as our favorite of all the Bible characters. We follow Paul because he's the apostle with the message that God gave for us. And if we're going to have the same mind, the same thinking, not be carnal, have the right judgment, we've got to think about Paul like, Paul like God thinks about Paul. He's a servant sent forth as an apostle with our message. And so we know where to go get our message. That's why we follow Paul. But other people hear us say things about Paul, and, oh, you guys just worship Paul. And, and so we, we need to deal with that a little bit to make sure that we understand that we're not Corinthians. And who knows, there could be Corinthians among us that are following Paul because they think, oh, you guys like him the best, so I'll like him the best too. Well, that's, that's not, it's not a matter of like. It's not a matter of a personal uh, uh, personality or anything. Now, when, if you stop and think about it, here's where you could spend a little bit of time and maybe you could on your own. When he says, uh, and it's interesting to me, the four names that he p p points out here. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul. He starts with himself as if it's wrong to say, I'm of Paul. And it is wrong to say that. Y you'll see why as we go on. <laughs> but, but certainly Paul would have been like the first one there to introduce him to Christ, so people are going to be loyal to Paul because they like Paul. He was the first one to come to Corinth. But then others might say, I am of Apollos. Now, can you tell, do you remember who Apollos is from Acts 18? See, at the end of Acts 18, Paul goes to Ephesus and takes Aquila and Priscilla with him. And when he leaves Ephesus, Apollos shows up and Aquila and Priscilla meet him, but it says of Apollos that he was an eloquent man. And, uh, What's this, what did he say about the scriptures? Uh, <laughs> jumped out of my mind. He's an eloquent man and something in the scriptures. Mighty in the scriptures. Knowing only the baptism of John. So Paul's converts, Aquila and Priscilla, take him to their house and expound to him the way of God more perfectly. Then it says when he left Corinth, or when he left Ephesus, he went to Corinth and helped them much who believed through faith. So, so here, Apollos is a very eloquent man, very knowledgeable in Old Testament scriptures, just learned about the update about the Apostle Paul in the Age of Grace. So he goes to Corinth and finds believers, and he's able to help them because he can certainly point out that Jesus is the Christ from the Old Testament. And, and because he's a very eloquent man, you would understand why some people would say, I am of Apollos. Yeah, Paul was here, but man, you ought to hear Apollos speak. Man, that guy is gifted. But is it the message or the man that you're listening to? And certainly they're, they're listening because of that man's sake. Then there's, there's men that are going to say, I am of Cephas. Now here's one of the things that I knew to something about this, but I knew I don't quite even still know everything that I should know about that name Cephas. Who is Cephas? Peter. Peter. The, the Lord named him Cephas. Back in, was it John chapter 1, something like verse 41? He said, Simon, thou art Cephas. And the Bible tells us, being interpreted a stone. But Cephas is the Aramaic. That's how Gentiles would say Peter's name. And then, but when he says, in being interpreted a stone, the way, a Greek way of saying it would be Petros, which is Peter. But why did the Lord say Cephas back there in chapter 1? And Paul, you read Galatians 1 and 2. Paul will almost always call Peter Cephas 
But, but when he's talking about Peter and going to a Jerusalem, he'd call him Peter. And Peter was the apostle of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles, uses Peter, and he's talking about Peter, and then he says, when, when James, Cephas, and John perceived the grace given unto me. Peter, 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 Cephas. Because now he's writing to a Gentile. When he's referring to Peter to the Jews, he calls him Peter. When he talks about Peter to Gentiles, he calls him Cephas. And, and why would the Corinthians here have referred to, in fact, Cephas is mentioned several times in Corinthians, uh, to Peter. Well, remember, there's a lot of Jews there at Corinth. And, and there might be that some people are saying, wait a minute, this Cephas, the Gentiles would call Peter Cephas, we, we ought to be acknowledging him, not this Paul guy. And, and so that might be, I, I, you know, just, just uh, Paul picks out four names, and they're particular, they're, there's, those names are, have a reason. He tells us why he picked him and Apollos later. But here's Cephas. And then, then it says, some people say, I am of Christ. Well, we're Christians. I like, if I'm going to pick anyone, that, that, let's say I'm of Christ. But one of the things Paul's going to deal with in the book of Corinthians are people who are prophets. And you know what they're liable to say is, I don't listen to Paul. I don't listen to Apollos. I don't listen to Cephas. I get my message directly from Jesus Christ. And, and they might be bypassing the Apostle Paul and trying to say they're of Christ. Now that's either following Christ in the earthly ministry or claiming that they don't listen to any man, they get their own revelation. Now whatever the problem is, it, they're not using Christ the right way in that, in that passage. Because later in chapter 11, be you followers of me as I also am a follower, as I also follow, <laughs> what does it say? Chapter 11 verse 1, be you followers of me even as I also am of Christ. And uh, so anyhow, Paul's got to correct him because all this has to do with personality rather than the person or the revelation uh, that God has given. And, and so those different names are there and, and people, they're following the man. And, uh, and, and, not, and not making proper judgment concerning how they ought to be evaluating a man. Um, so... The first section, we said chapters 1 through 4, is, uh, is dealing with this conflict. And there, there's four points. Boy, this, week, this day went fast. As I looked at chapter 1 through 4, and, and I, I guess I went deeper in this. And, but anyhow, I want you to, we started out there in verse 12 with the rebuke of I am of Paul, starting that. And then over chapter 4, verse 16, be you followers of me. So how do you get from this point to that point? Well, there's four arguments. There might be more if you look closer, but just kind of keeping things in general. The first point is that the major issue is not man, but the message. Now watch, watch chapter 12, and let me keep reading. After he makes those statements, he says in verse 13, Is Christ divided? Now we talk about right division all the time. And we say, wait a minute, yeah, there's divisions. But is Christ divided? No, he's the savior of the kingdom saints as well as he's the sa savior of the body of Christ. He's not divided. Uh, it, he's not divided in the sense he's the, sa the same savior. Salvation is only in Christ. There's, there's no division there. Now, does Christ divide? Oh, yeah. When he was in his earthly ministry, he said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And he said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Christ himself is not divided. But Christ does make division. And that today there is a division between what God was doing and what God is doing today. But the question, is Christ divided? No, Christ is not divided. He says, was Paul crucified for you? Were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Now, there's something here that, we're running out of time, but what I said, I started looking at some things more closely. The, the statement of of. Like in verse 12 when it says, Now every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. What in the world does that mean? Well, when, it, when you say of, the word of is a word that has, has the meaning of belonging to. In it, 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 different places it has different meanings, but certainly it's belonging to or maybe even the source I'm of Paul, like he is the source of my identity, of my association. And, and, and so they're saying, I am of in that sense. 
And, and I started looking at that of because I tell you, the word of always throws me. But they didn't just say, I follow Paul. They're saying, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Where there's certainly, as the problem gets down about baptism, there's certainly an identity there that they're identifying. And when Paul, he says, is Christ divided? There's not, there's not a problem with Christ is divided up. The problem is they're divided by their identifying and they're not defi- identifying with God, with Christ the way God said to identify with Christ. They're identifying with man and actually saying they're, they're getting their identity from a man as causing as if the man is the source. And that's why I said the, the issue here is it's not of man, but the, it's the message of God. The, certainly here the message of the cross. For instance, in verse 11, well, well, let me tell you this. I accidentally did this, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. Verses 1 through 10 of this, of this book, look at the word of. If you look in verse 1, it talks about, just, just look at the verse, and it's of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, it says, of God, and then later it says, of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, it says, of God. Verse 6, it says, of Christ. Verse 7, I know you can't follow them that fast, but we're just going to throw it out. Verse 7 is, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9 is, of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 10 is, of, our, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you get to verse 12, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paulus, I am of Christ. Everything centers, when you talk about of as the, the very source and the one that you belong to, it's all God. Then the Corinthians, they're fighting over as if man is the source, and they're identifying and belonging to a man. And, and, and that's the problem. If you look at verse 10, when it says, uh, when it says, it, uh, I beseech you, brethren, by, no, not verse 10, verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Clo. So we are talking about the source here, right? Of the house of Clo. That, that the source of this information is coming from the house of Clo. And so you get the word, the idea that of has to do with the very source of something. And then when, when it talks about being uh, uh, identified with, uh, later on it'll talk about the wisdom of the world. Well, what's wisdom of the world? Well, that's wisdom. The source comes from human thinking, not from God. So when they're using the word of there, they're, they're using as if they're identifying as if everything they have comes from that Paul's the source or that Apollos is the source or Cephas is the source. And even though Paul is an apostle, it's, he's not the source. The source is of God. And, and, and that's, that's the whole point of this and that it's all of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so that's why they're going to be told, well, I'll just jump to the conclusion for this and pick it up next week. It says in verse 28, he says, of chapter 1, verse 20, God has chosen the base things of this world, the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, for, uh, but of him, that is of God, are ye in Christ, who of God, there's your source, is made unto us wisdom, wisdom not from the world, righteousness, not of man, (laughs) sanctification, that's through the Holy Spirit, and redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So you see where the problem of the Corinthians were, and they're glorying in men, they're identifying with man, they're making man the source of truth, rather than realizing it all comes from God and it's all through Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so the first issue that Paul deals with is that it's not of man, but it's the message, and where he's going to go with this is the message of the cross. Uh, we'll pick up there because we want to talk a little bit about that baptism issue that, that uh, is part of the cause where people are identifying with man and it's associated with them being baptized, where Paul says, I'm glad I didn't baptize in my own name. But we'll pick up there next week. Well, I hope that's helpful. To me, it was rambling because we didn't get through chapter 4. <laughs> Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I, I do pray that we'll see the very basic things that where the Corinthians are going wrong is not replacing their thinking with the truth of your word and that they're glorying in men rather than looking at the revelation. First, the revelation of the cross and how the cross is the means by which it's the power, your power to save us and that everything is given to us by you through Christ. 
And, uh, and Father, I pray that we might realize that we got that information because you revealed it to Paul to give to us. And so we follow Paul because he is the apostle with the message from you for each one of us that we might mind the same things and have the same judgment. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.